I guess that's uh, good as it gets. Not too bad. Uh, so I've uh, got an application here of uh, some maple computing, uh, basically lin linear algebra over polynomial rings, and also uh, some Grobner basis computations. Uh, it's an application to a, a problem in algebraic operads, uh, which most people don't know about, but you've probably been hearing about them more and more, especially in connection with uh, combinatorics and possibly theoretical physics and maybe uh, certainly topology. Um, anyway, this is work uh, together with Vladimir Dotsenko. Uh, well, I'm from University of Saskatchewan. Uh, Vladimir uh, was at Trinity College Dublin and he just this summer moved to University of Strasbourg in France. Okay, so I'm going to try to make opera comprehensible to you in five minutes. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm looking at uh, operads uh, over vector spaces, or operads in the category of vector spaces over a field of characteristic zero. Now, don't be intimidated by the word operad. Its um, basic ideas are very similar, and if you've uh, similar to what well, you know the ideas already, and it's especially similar to basic ideas in universal algebra if you've ever studied that. Um, so I'm going to talk about what are called symmetric operads. And the word symmetric means that we've got an action of the symmetric group, uh, rather all of the symmetric groups um, in all degrees. So I have a sequence. So uh, P is the operad. Uh, it consists of a sequence of modules over the symmetric group SN. So P of N for N greater than or equal to 1 is a module over SN. So that'll be, in our case, is a finite dimensional vector space, which emits an action of Sn. And how should you interpret elements of Pn? Well, think of them as a multilinear n-area operation um, on some unspecified vector space. So operad purists would get mad at me for even mentioning this. Uh, operads are supposed to be just an abstract representation of oper operations. So, uh, Thinking of an underlying vector space is sort of like thinking of a group as a group of permutations, where thinking of the operand itself is just like thinking of an abstract group. And so we've got n area operations, and the group Sn, the groups Sn act by permuting the arguments of the operations. Uh, now, so that much is you know, fairly uh, uh, straightforward, but the, we've also got to compose operations. Uh, and we do that by what are called partial compositions using the circ symbol. Um, it has two, sub, two superscripts, M and N. And that means I'm taking an operation of uh, arity M and an operation of arity N. And I'm combining them to produce an operation of arity M plus N minus 1. And the subscript I is telling me well, I take the n area operation and I stick it into the <laughs> ith argument of the m area operation. So f circle mn i, usually the mn's are omitted in this notation. So it represents substitution of the operation g, which is an n area operation, into the ith argument of the operation f, which is an m area operation. So, um, so when we do this, we're losing one of the arguments of f and we're replacing it by the n arguments of g. So that's where we get m plus n minus 1 here. So if you want to write this as an algebraic equation, you get this. In the composition, you have m plus n minus 1 arguments, and that's obtained by substituting g into the position i of f. And notice that I've also had to re-index the variables so that I have the identity permutation there. Okay. Uh, now, there's uh, some uh, subtleties about how the action of the symmetric group uh, should be compatible or uh, with the partial compositions. Uh, the technical term is that partial compositions need to be equivariant with respect to the action of the symmetric group. Uh, but if you do examples that, you know, sort of all fairly obvious, uh, you know, what you're used to with composition of uh, multivariate functions. So there's a notion of a free operad. Uh, and so uh, free operads, well, to have a free operad, I need to 
choose a set of generating operations. So again, this uh, reminds, <coughs> should remind you of some basic ideas on universal algebra. Um, so I've got a disjoint union of uh, sets of operation symbols. So every element in xk represents an operation of verity k. Now I'm going to, this is very general and looks complicated. I'm going to very soon reduce to the case where we've just got a single binary operation. Uh, but this is the general picture. And so I write uh, T of X for the free opera generated by the operations X. Now T, uh, the letter T is used here because all of these can be represented by planar rooted trees. So um, compositions of operations corresponds to uh, grafting of one rooted tree onto another rooted tree, replacing the leaf of one tree by the root of uh, the other tree. Uh, so that's basically the sort of uh, graphical geometric idea underlying this partial composition operation that I was talking about on the previous slide. So a basis for this free operand, a basis for the set of nary operations, or the vector space of nary operations, consists of all planar trees with n leaves, where each internal node, including the root, uh, with k children is labeled by some f in xk. So each internal node represents the k area operation, which combines uh, the outputs of its k children. And uh, we have altogether n leaves, and they're labeled by a permutation of x1 to xn. And I was, as I was explaining a moment ago, the partial composition of trees corresponds to grafting of one tree, uh, the root of one tree onto the leaf of another tree. And then again, there's some subtleties uh, to write down correctly the definition of this e equivariance with respect to this metric group is much more confusing than just doing a few examples and uh, seeing what it looks like in practice. Now, the reason I talked about free operads is because I want to talk about operads which are generated by certain operations satisfying certain relations. So this uh, slide will remind you of um, something like uh, ideals in rings and quotient rings. Uh, but now, let's simplify the whole picture drastically. Assume x equals x2, operators generated by binary operations. And then Txn is spanned by all partial compositions of the binary operations, which just means all labeled binary trees with n leaves obtained by repeating, repeated grafting of the generating binary trees. So each of the binary operations is re represented by a root with two leaves. Uh, so the root representing a composition of the uh, arguments or labeling the leaves. So now, uh, and we're looking at linear combinations of these trees. So if we look at arity three, so operations uh, with three arguments, um, it's called the quadratic relation in operad uh, terminology, uh, which is a little bit confusing at first. N equals three, but each tree monomial with, each tree with three leaves has two internal loads, two operations occurring in it. And in operads, the focus is on the operations more than on the arguments. So quadratic refers to the number of operations. And so any uh, subspace, or it has to be an S3 submodule, is a space of quadratic relations. And then given a space of relations, we can generate the operand ideal, which is basically the uh, S sequence of SN modules obtained by taking all linear combinations of all permutations of uh, the tree polynomials obtained by partial compositions uh, of the elements of that generating set by arbitrary elements of T of X. So that's like the closure condition for, the, for ideals in ring theory. And then we have a natural notion of quotient operad. And to give a very simple, familiar example, um, we can look at one operation uh, satisfying the associativity relation. And that even makes sense with just trees. So a set operad, where instead of putting a minus sign there and thinking of it as equal to zero, you just put an equal sign there. And let me just make sure I'm. Yeah, as always, I'm going a little bit slower than I expected, but that's okay. Now, this slide is very technical. If uh, anybody claims they understand this, I will not 
believe you. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm going to uh, go through this uh, very quickly. Uh, Vladimir is the theoretical operat guy uh, in this research, and I'm more of the concrete computer algebra guy. Uh, what we want to do is we want to take two quadratic operats. Uh, in this case, it's going to be the operat governing commutative associative algebras and the operat governing Lie algebras. So those are two quadratic uh, operats governing very uh, familiar classes of algebras. And I want to compose them in some way. I want to uh, create an operat which has both a commutative associative product and a Lie bracket. And those two operations need to be related in some nice way. And probably the most familiar example of this is uh, Poisson algebras, which have a commutative associative product, a Lie bracket. And the Lie bracket acts by derivations uh, with respect to the uh, commutative associative product. That's the most familiar example of what's called a distributive law. Um, in operads, and this even goes back, it comes from some work done in general category theory done 30 years ago, or maybe even longer than that. Anyway, um, this is technical uh, jargon. We have, well, we have two operats given by two quadratic operats, quotient operats, generated by you know, certain operations and relations. Again, assuming binary generators and quadratic relations. We're going to look at, we're going to construct a new operat O, generated by the union, uh, this one union of the set of the two operations, um, by an inhomogeneous distributive rewriting rule, if the defining relations of O have this form. And what am I saying here? Well, I'm basically saying that we keep the operations that define S. Um, we modify <coughs> the relations defining R so that they <coughs> will be equivalent to the original relations modulo uh, the uh, um, relations S and um, uh, and D is telling us uh, basically how the uh, how the two operations are uh, related. Okay, so don't worry too much about that slide. And going further with just a little bit more technical stuff. Uh, we um, uh, we want to we have inhomogeneous distributive rewriting rules, and if uh, the maps that I've been talking about uh, give us compose to give us an isomorphism, it's called an inhomogeneous distributive law. Now, what does inhomogeneous mean here? Everything I'm talking about is quadratic operands, so generated by binary operations. So you might be wondering why I'm talking about inhomogeneous. Uh, um, remember that with operands, the focus is on the operations, not on the uh, arguments. So everything I've been talking about is homogeneous with respect to the arguments. Everything in operands generally is homogeneous with respect to the arguments. But inhomogeneous here means uh, that, for example, um, well you might have a relation that uh, uh, the, the terms in the relations are not homogeneous in the operations. So like one term might include two copies of one operation, the next term might in include one copy of each operation, the next term might include two copies of the other operation. So not homogeneous with respect to the operations. Okay, so now let's get a lot more concrete and talk about the operands com and li. Uh, so for the operand com, uh, I should pause here for questions, but I'm not going to because somebody's going to ask me to explain the last two slides and I don't have time for that. <laughs> so uh, just rest assured that from now on things get uh, a lot more concrete. Okay, so the operand com consists of a single binary generator uh, binary operation which is commutative, so it satisfies that. Uh, that's not considered a relation in operand theory, it's actually considered uh, uh, the structure of the S2 module um, generated by that operation. And the relations, quadratic relations, satisfied this, op this operation, uh, well, it's associativity, but since we're allowing all permutations of the three arguments, we actually need to consider two uh, versions of associativity, and they span a copy of the two-dimensional irreducible S3 module. So that's generators and relations for the operand com. 
And for the upright Lie, well, uh, of course, if you know what a Lie algebra is, you could know this already. We have a single anti-commutative operation, binary operation, and it satisfies the Jacobi identity in Arity 3, and that Jacobi relation by itself spans the one-dimensional S3 module, which is the sine module. Okay, so, so what we were interested in is finding all uh, distributive laws between these two operands. So, as I mentioned, Poisson algebras governed by the Poisson operand are the most familiar example. We were wondering if there are any other examples, and could we possibly classify all the examples? Okay, well, how do we do this computation then? Well, um, what does an inhomogeneous distributive law look like explicitly uh, combining these two operats, commutative and Li? Well, um, uh, you may remember that from the theoretical slides, uh, you could tell that the order of these operats makes a difference. Uh, so we're combining com and Li. So that means the relations satisfied by the Li operat, namely the Jacobi identity, uh, remain unchanged. Uh, the associativity only needs to be satisfied modulo the Jacobi identity, and uh, that simplifies to something like this because the sum over the cyclic permutations is zero of this monomial and of the uh, associator here. Um, but we have one free parameter there, which we're calling T3. And again, for technical reasons, um, there is one more possible relation um, relating all these operations, which, uh, so notice that here, each term has two Lie brackets in it. Here, this term has two associative products, this term has two associative products, that term has two Lie brackets. So this is already inhomogeneous in the operatic sense. And if you work out the theory and apply it to this particular case, we also have relations, uh, we have to consider relations of this form with two more parameters, T1 and T2. And here this term has one associative product, one commutative associative product and one Lie bracket. Uh, same thing in these, uh, these two terms, but the order is reversed. Here the Lie bracket is a factor of the commutative product. Uh, and then here we have terms that involve two Lie brackets. So we have to consider uh, these three types of relations. And now the map eta that I was talking about uh, earlier in the theoretical part, um, to get an in uh, inhomogeneous distributive law, that map has to be an isomorphism. Um, and it's, well, suffices to check that it's an isomorphism in Arity 4. And for that to be true, uh, it's necessary uh, and, uh, well, necessary that the uh, S4 module in Arity 4 of this composed operand should uh, have dimension 24. In fact, we need it to be isomorphic to the um, regular representation of the symmetric group S4. So this is where we get into actual computing. Um, uh, we did some similar computing a few years ago <laughs> in a paper we wrote that appeared in the Canadian Math Journal uh, on classification of regular parameterized one relation operands. I'll give you the uh, reference to that later at the end. Uh, we use mostly the uh, Maple packages, linear algebra and Grobner. Um, so we construct an, uh, choose an ordered basis of the Arity 3 component of this free operand. That basically just means writing down all possible monomials of Arity 3 involving the compute commutative product and the Lie bracket in all possible combinations, either two commutative products or one commutative product in the Lie bracket, uh, or one Lie bracket, one commutative product, uh, or two Lie brackets. And then you have to allow different permutations of the variables. Um, in order to get all possible distinct monomials. 
And so what is this? Well, let's go start at the bottom here. At the bottom here we have the Jacobi identity. Um, at the top here we have the uh, second type of relation on the previous slide with the parameter T3. Um, what did I do here? Now I'm confusing myself a little bit. Um, anyway, uh, these are... Yes, these are the possible, all possible sets of relations we could have defining this composed operat O from Li and Com. Okay, so we have six relations there. Uh, so we have six relations that will call R1 to R6, and they involve the two generators, the commutative product and the Lie bracket. We apply, uh, we take all compositions, partial compositions of those relations with either the uh, commutative product or the Lie bracket. Basically that amounts to substituting for x1 everywhere in here another commutative product like x1, x4 or substituting in place of x1 the Lie bracket of x1 with x4. And similarly for x2, similarly for x3, uh, or we can plug this, the one whole relation into a commutative product with x4 or into a Lie bracket with x4. So there's many, many ways uh, to uh, construct consequences of these relations in ARD4. And that's because we're looking at the next uh, component, the ERD4 component of the operand ideal generated by those relations. Okay, um, so from those six, uh, and applying all 24 permutations, without any simplification, uh, we get total uh, 111,000, say this right, 1,152 consequences in ERD4. Uh, these consequences are linear combinations of the tree monomials, uh, which form a basis of the 120-dimensional vector space uh, in this free operand in ARD4. And so we have these 1152 relations represented as coefficient vectors with respect to 120 monomials. So I can put all those coefficient vectors in a matrix of size 1152 by 120. Uh, the entries of that matrix are polynomials in, in three variables. Uh, in fact, the entries are going to be just scalars and individual variables at this point. And um, we need to uh, impose a monomial order on this polynomial ring. Uh, I wrote Q here at the beginning. I wrote arbitrary field of characteristic zero. So replace Q by, by F here. Um, well, actually, the coefficients are all integers, but we need a field, so uh, Q is correct here. Uh, now, that polynomial ring in three variables is not a PID. In fact, as soon as you go to two or more variables, you lose the fact that it's a PID, uh, uh, not a Euclidean domain, uh, and not even a PID. And so we can't compute natural things like Hermit normal form or Smith normal form of the matrix. But this matrix has a lot of scalar entries in it. In fact, a lot of its entries are plus or minus one. So we can try to start computing a Smith form, namely by using row and column operations to swap uh, these scalar entries up onto the uh, upper left diagonal of the matrix. Um, if we've got a, a constant element, a uh, non-zero element on that diagonal, we can make it one by another row operation, and then we can use that scalar, that element one, that entry one, to zero out <coughs> everything in the in its column and in its uh, in its row, gradually getting a bigger and bigger identity matrix in the upper left corner. But at some point. Uh, we're going to have to stop because this will only work as long as the remaining lower right block in the matrix contains a non-zero scalar. And at some point, that uh, ceases to be the case. So with this matrix, it turns out we were able to do 96 steps, which is nice because 96 is 96. If, if this matrix has rank 96, uh, 
then since it has 120 columns, it's, it will have nullity 24, and that's the nullity that we want. So we get nine identity matrix of size 96, a huge zero matrix here, a zero matrix there, and a, a huge tall lower right block there, which contains polynomials in three variables. And we want that lower right block to be zero. Um, so we need to know uh, what values of the parameters make that lower right block zero. So this lower right block has size 1056 by 24, has, but has many zero rows, so we just delete those. So deleting the zero rows of L uh, um, prime, we obtain a uh, 372 by 24 matrix L, which contains uh, 126 distinct elements of uh, the polynomial ring. And basically, we want to know what values of the parameters T1, T2, T3 make that matrix zero. Uh, so, well, we want to make all those polynomials zero at the same time, 126 distinct polynomials. Um, since we're just interested in all those polynomials being zero, we can replace each of those polynomials by its monic form. And that gives us uh, 56 distinct polynomials. And I uh, should have mentioned up here that or even on the previous slide, that all of those polynomials in that lower right block uh, have degrees 2 and 3, so it's not uh, too bad. Uh, so we just need to compute a Grobner basis. We have 56 polynomials in three variables with respect to that basic monomial order. Compute a Grobner basis, and, well, it turns out to be a very nice, simple Grobner basis. So we are interested in what values of the parameters make uh, those three polynomials zero, that's easy to see. Well, obviously, T2 has to be zero uh, in all cases. Um, if T1 is one, uh, then T3 is uh, arbitrary. And so if T1 is one, T2 is always zero. And then if T1 is one, then T3 is arbitrary. If T1 is not one, then T3 must be uh, uh, must be zero, and then this implies that T1 must be zero. So the zero set of that ideal consists of a point and a line, one parameter, uh, so it's a one-dimensional uh, uh, variety. In fact, it's a point and a line. Uh, now, I mentioned when I was mentioning, talking about the rank uh, being 96, the nullity being 24, uh, the dimension of that space in the uh, operand O, the already 4 space, should be 24. <laughs> well, that was just a necessary condition, but it turns out uh, by some previous work uh, that all of the operands we obtain by this, from these values are, in fact, uh, due to find inhomogeneous distributive laws between the commutative operand and the Lie operand. And um, now, of course, we have this parameter here. So it makes you wonder, well, are these operads possibly isomorphic for different values of the parameter? Well, the automorphism group of this operad is rather, uh, or that's the family of operads is rather small because um, the, um, the commutative operation, by any isomorphism, the commutative operation needs to go to a non-zero scalar multiple of the commutative operation, and the anti-commutative operation needs to go to a non-zero scalar multiple of the uh, anti-commutative uh, operation. We can't do any switching of operations or linear combinations of operations. So this gives us the final result, which is putting those values of the parameter back into uh, relations. Um, in three arguments, quadratic relations uh, relating the commutative uh, product and the Lie bracket. And we've changed, uh, well, there's only one parameter, T3, but we're calling that Q now. Uh, this first uh, operad, the quadratic relations there are exactly, uh, well, no, wait a second. This is, what is this? This is associativity for the commutative operation. This is the Lie bracket 
the Jacobi identity for the anti-commutative operation, and whoops, and this is sort of the this is the trivial case corresponding to the point zero zero zero, where if you take a commutative product and then take the Lie bracket of that, that's going to be identically zero. So that's the less interesting case, without the parameter. This is the case corresponding to the line with the parameter. Uh, what do we have here? Well, again, we have the Jacobi identity for the Lie bracket. Uh, here we have associativity for the commutative operation, but modulo this term uh, involving two Lie brackets and the coefficient. So uh, in this operat, the commutative operation is not necessarily associative. It's only associative modulo uh, iterated Lie brackets. And what's this middle relation? Well, this, if you rearrange it uh, and use commutative, commutativity and anti-commutativity, you'll see that it's just saying that the Lie bracket acts as the derivation of the commutative product. Uh, left bracketing with x3, uh, if I take these two negative terms over to the other side, it says that if I take the commutative product x1, x2, left bracket it by x3, uh, then I get x1 bracketed by x3, x2, and x1 times bracket of x2 with x3. So just the ordinary derivation law, or the product rule in first-year calculus. And well, up to isomorphism, uh, the only problem is that different operads for different parameter values might be isomorphic. Uh, all we have to do, though, is uh, uh, modu modulo out, factor out the um, uh, squares in the group of units, and um, I think there's a typo here. Uh, I have to check that. In any case, over complex numbers, uh, all of these for non-zero q, all of these are isomorphic. Uh, so we really only uh, get two distinct um, operands there. Uh, for non-zero q. They're all isomorphic, and when q is zero, then this term disappears, and I get exactly the uh, well-known Poisson operand uh, that is, uh, you know, appears so frequently in theoretical physics, Hamiltonian mechanics in particular. Uh, good. So that's just about it. Let me give you some references. Um, this is the book that Vladimir and I wrote, uh, which uh, well, let me start here with the. Uh, Book, the book by Lodet and Vallette on algebraic operands. Um, this is a rather intimidating book, even for me. Uh, entire abstract theory of algebraic operands. Uh, not too many algorithms in there, so Vladimir and I decided it would be nice to write an algorithmic companion to that book, uh, which appeared in 2016. Uh, this is the paper that Vladimir and I wrote that I mentioned in the Canadian Journal. Um, I quoted a couple of papers there that uh, proved that, that necessary condition was also sufficient. Uh, one is by Vladimir and his uh, graduate student, and this is the other one. And, uh, or is it, was it this one? I can't remember. Anyway, I'm not sure if I referred to that one. Anyway, that's beside the point. Those are my references, and thank you very much for your attention, and if there are any questions. Elias, yes. do you uh, understand? Yeah, I do have a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so from 56 polynomials, you're down to 3. Yeah, when you compute yeah, the Grobner basis. That's very, very <coughs> unusual for a Grobner basis. Typically, you get more, so maybe there is some structure. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, this, this, this matrix, uh, this started off as a huge matrix, but it had a lot of zero rows, so we threw them all away. And then, um, yeah, that matrix has, doesn't contain as much information as it looks because it's uh, such a big matrix. So, yeah, uh, when you... We get a lot more polynomials than we really need to generate that idea. A lot more. Do you have a vague idea what an operand is now? Uh, well, very vague. Okay. <laughs> I must admit it. It's yeah, you, 
it's uh, it's a difficult theory. The general theory is extremely uh, difficult, but uh, I, I was going. I was hoping to explain in more detail the uh, the uh, interpretation in terms of trees, especially of the free operat. But I thought that was going to take me too far astray. But I'll talk to you about that if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, and I think it's time for lunch. Yes. <laughs>